Welcome to The Boundary Spanners, a podcast on residential decarbonization with me, Nate, the blue collar CEO of HVAC 2.0. And I'm Abi, a white collar policy researcher based in Canada. In this podcast, we're taking tacit, unspoken and hands-on knowledge from the white and blue collar worlds and turning it into explicit and actionable out loud insights for residential decarbonization. The views expressed in the show are entirely personal. You can follow the Boundary Spanners podcast on YouTube or wherever you get your favorite podcasts from. Thank you for listening. This particular episode, I think, is titled The Four Horsemen of H. Vacalypse. Does that sound about ding, right? ding, ding. That is exactly it. So we, we, we have now created like another horrible word out there. So uh, <laughs> it's like two celebrities getting together. We're going to mix their names together. Yeah. I mean, from uh, the church at the kitchen table to like, you know, four horsemen of the H. Vacalypse. <laughs> sensing a pattern here, like a very end of days, you know, biblical themed uh, pattern. But um, so in this episode is, is, is putting my ability to blend in with the locals to the test. Mm -hmm. Okay. One thing I pride myself in is being able to bl <laughs> blend in with the locals, no matter where I go. Mm -hmm. I, it's a, I, I, I work hard on it. The way I'm speaking now is uh, this is an affectation. This is not how I normally speak. Uh, when I speak with my friends from India, even if we end up do speaking in English, and this is a, you know, this is an affectation. I, and I, I pause and I enunciate every word differently because when we speak English, because it's not my first language, I end up speaking in a monotone, whereas when I speak my native language, it kind of, it has natural inflections. Yeah. So I have to pause myself like I just did so I can enunciate it. So this is, this is part of me trying to blend in with the local, so I'm better understood. Mm -hmm. I can better belong in places. So over the past four or five years, I've been blending in with the blue collar workforce and I've identified the four horsemen of the HVAC ellipse, by which I mean, there are four large-scale selection pressures, deep existential issues that are bearing upon the HVAC industry that keeps the men and women of HVAC industry up at night. Mm -hmm. And these four issues are creating incredible selection pressures on the industry and layering on decarbonization on top of these four big existential challenges is a recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. And unless policymakers try to work with the HVAC industry to find uh, solutions to these four existential challenges, simply just slapping on decarbonization as a goal on top of this is not going to be, uh, it's not going to result in, in it, it's not going to bring out good results for anyone involved, the HVAC contractors, the blue collar workers, the policymakers, the you know, taxpayers, the citizens, public, no one. Yeah. So, that, so, so this is after like, this is like me, like I'm like a war correspondent, right? Like I'm like this year five, I've blended in with the locals. They don't, you know, they see me as one of them and here's my report. And so I, I want to bounce these off of you because for me, this is, I'm trying to tap into the tacit knowledge stuff that you know from decades of experience. And me, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to see if me make, if I'm right on the money in, in how I'm able to tap into the existential angst that I feel like is pervasive through the HVAC industry. Okay, Let's so- Let's do it, hit me. What are, your, what are the four? Okay, so number one, skill short, <clears throat> pardon me, skill shortage. So what I mean by skills shortage is there's both, um, we talked about this in a, in a different, in, in an earlier episode. HVAC is an incredibly skilled trade, much more so than perhaps some of the other trades because you need a combination of skills. Plumbing, mm -hmm. gas, electrical, maybe even sheet metal, sometimes even carpenting, refrigeration. And this is just for the technical people on staff. You also need sales, in order to run a successful business, you need, mm -hmm. you need salespeople who can, um, you need, well, first of all, you need marketing people uh, so, so that you can turn your service territory into prospects. You need yep. salespeople that can turn good, good leads or prospects into, into clients. You need program managers, you need supervisors. You need, so, so the whole, the whole sector, ecosystem. Yeah. the whole ecosystem, fantastic word, whole ecosystem in HVAC um, industry, is experiencing both a shortage in quality um, and quantity. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people who do things with rule of thumb stuff, but skilled workforce that can grow the industry, that can respond to new challenges, that can 
play across these different knowledge domains that can you know turn turn from marketing to sales and that to me a lot of HR companies are, are worried about being able to recruit and retain skilled workforce. Does that sound about right? Do you want to expand on that? Yeah. So um, we have spent the last twenty years. I mean, you and I are both largely products of it. Maybe you, you less so, being you know originally from India, uh, but. Uh, it, we spent the last 20 years telling everyone, go to college, go to college, go to college, go to college. Um, and now we have, frankly, an, an overabundance of overeducated people um, and not enough positions for them. So we have that issue, but uh, that has caused, on the other hand, we're looking down on the trades in general. It's the, the last acceptable prejudice. Uh, and that has created a skill shortage because it's like, well, go to college. Well, th that kid's not a good fit for college. I mean, like my, 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 my dad was an extraordinarily mechanical person, like unlike anything I've ever seen, which made me feel like an idiot because it's like being Michael Jordan's son who, you know, can barely make a layup. Um, it just sucked. Um, uh, it's like, I will never, like at my best, I'm maybe 25% of my dad's ability at my absolute best. If everything's perfect. Um, so he went to college for a year at uh, Oral Roberts University. So very conservative Christian college. And he's like, they, they wanted you to be either a preacher or a teacher. And I didn't want to be either. So he made it for a year and six weeks and quit. Mm -hmm. And he found a path that was better for him. Um, he was fundamentally a blue collar person. Uh, now he had a business. Um, he was not the best businessman, but uh, uh, he, he had a business. And uh, it, his skills were just spectacular. Although so much of his knowledge was tacit and it died with him when he committed suicide uh, in January. Um, and that's that's a horrible shame because there was a lot of cool stuff rattling around in that brain um, that you know, it's very me mentally ill brain. Uh, but we have spent 20 years now pushing kids away from the trades. So we're not allowing people to go find their path like that. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's kind of cool. I, I live in a hauler now in West Virginia. Um, so, I mean, there's... There's nobody white collar near where I live. <laughs> it's, uh, um, everybody's good with their hands here. Everybody knows how to fix stuff. Uh, it, it's a different thing. And uh, I, I would love to see, like in Germany, uh, auto mechanics are revered. I, I would love to see skills going back to being revered. Um, but as it is, I mean, it, it, I made a couple of HVAC owners groups on Facebook and it's just constantly like, I can't find anybody. I can't find anybody. I can't find anybody. And then worse, the programs that are out there for trade schools are usually teaching kids um, either the incorrect stuff or the incorrect way of thinking. So nine out of 10 HVAC contractors I've talked to have said, I don't want kids out of trade school because they're harder to retrain in the right way than it is to just get an 18 year old off the street and take them green and run them through everything. Um, but we have a little knowledge. Little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Yes, exactly. But, Especially but you when know enough to be dangerous. Yeah. 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 It, it, but it's harder to unteach. I mean, it's what, what is that Mark Twain uh, saying? Like uh, the 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 truth has barely crossed the street before the lie goes around the world. Um, and so we have kind of similar problems there. But uh, the other issue that we have, which I think you'll know, get to in a little bit, is the the kids that are eighteen years old haven't really worked on anything. So they may not know which end of the screwdriver to use. You know, they're, they're good at working phones and you know, oftentimes they know programming and things like that. But the, the, the basic mechanical skills are, in my opinion, much more rare than they once were because we don't have to fix stuff. So that, that's an issue. So yeah, skill shortage, we're in this for 20 years. Uh, like we, we have to first change our cultural uh, norm. Like uh, I love watching Mike Rowe doing this. Of dirty jobs. I mean, he's been out there beating this drum for years, and he's so smart and so funny um, and so right on so much of this. Uh, go, go watch what Mike Rowe is doing, please, because that, that's really yeah. important. We, we need to restore the honor and the dignity to Blue Collar. 100%. And Mike Rowe talks about this on an individual level. Uh, don't pursue your passions because, you know, they might not always lead to opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, or you might actually fall out of love with things that you're passionate about at any given point of time in your life. But pursue opportunity, but bring your passion with you. Yeah. Be passionate about things that, you know, bring your passion into whatever you do and pursue opportunity instead. So now at this point of time, HVAC, the trades in general are a good pathway to a, a, a reasonable middle-class job, middle-class mm -hmm. lifestyle, right? Yep. So if we were to use like micros, like pursue opportunity and you know, one of the things about like, you know, what, one of what you were talking about earlier when we were pushing kids to go to university and stuff, letting them find their passion or opportunity, but instead of narrowing down their uh, their opportunity space, 
I think in part because over time it's become uh, the, the the pathway to you know at least that works you know work smart not hard kind of mentality, right? Uh, and you know like why do you want to be um, a, a frontline worker when you can be the foreman? People have been talking about this for millennia. There's actually if, you know if someone if listeners want to look this up, there's um, a poem written in 3500 BC, like oh, sorry 1500 BC, so like 3500 years ago in Egypt called a set satire on the trades where a dad is talking to his, to his son and saying, why do you want to go into the trades? Why do you want to spend 12 hours next to a furnace when you can be the boss pointing fingers at someone and telling them what to do instead? So this, this mentality is enduring. And that's what many mean is the last presence that's still alive. Culturally, we have that mentality and that, and that makes it difficult for young people, impressionable people to make the choice. It's almost seen like a fallback option, plan B, plan C. Yeah, yeah. Oh, maybe I'm not smart enough. I was just talking to a 16 year old the other day. And he was saying, I was asking him what his plans were because he's going into high school now, senior. And he was saying, man, I don't know if I'm smart enough to go to university, so I think I'll just go get a trade. That, that attitude, right, where it's the, the fallback option, that that's leading to a self-selection of individuals who may be exceptionally gifted mechanically and technically uh, end up in trades. But at the same time, what happens is that they trades become becomes narrowly specific to people who can just sling boxes together. Yep. But the entire ecosystem struggles to retain that high level of talent i know for example and you can corroborate this you know but this is my tacit understanding um in an hvac business the owner usually has high closing rates mm -hmm. and and high job numbers right so they have like 60 70 percent closing rates maybe if they're really good um but the next person in line has a closing rate of like 40 yeah, percent or 30 or 25 30 or 25 the owner is like 50, 60 years old, likely retiring in the next decade or so. The next person in line is 30 years old with a closing ratio of 40%. So what you describe with your father and a lot of the no tacit knowledge that he had just went with him when he left mm -hmm. us is also happening in the HVAC industry where a lot of the a lot of people have developed skills through long years of experience in the sector. Yeah. Like business skills, sales skills, being able to actually diagnose a client's problem and fix stuff. And once once that once that generation of owners and, and senior techs are gone, the the mechanism through which we produce the next generation of techs is focused on credentials and focused on technical and explicit knowledge. Yeah. But there's not enough spaces through which they learn tacitly about de developing skills around marketing, developing skills around talking to clients, developing skills around closing jobs better. And that's taken together. This is you talk to HVAC owners and senior techs in the industry; they're worried sick about the next generation of workforces. And I mean, some of this is—I mean, let, I mean, let's be honest, right? Some of this is oh, the young kids. I mean, that's that's typical. You know, you go to any Can't any find good people these days, yeah. Like you it's, and I, it's been a, thing a decade forever. from now, like I mean, take it five years and two two months from now, you and I are probably going to hit that age group where we're like, oh, kids these days, right? <laughs> but, but but some of it is just natural, you know. I understand that, but but still, uh, in this trade, especially in HVAC, the 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 next generation is confronted with, with significantly different challenges than the previous generation did, but have, don't have the same long runway, don't have the same cultural expectations that, that the early generation did and how they got into the mm -hmm. industry versus the new generation coming in. So the selection pressures on the new generation is making it, we have fewer and fewer people entering into the industry and the ones that do enter into the industry are, are entering into it because they are self-selecting themselves because they don't think they're quote unquote good enough for university. And once they're there, the explicit way in which we teach these things doesn't touch on the other aspects of how to be successful in a business. They might teach you how to sling boxes together. But you're saying maybe they don't even have those skills. And so taken together, there's a skill shortage in the industry that is keeping people up at night. Yep. Does that sound about right? Am I right on that? That Am is the first something? of the horsemen right there. No, there's, yeah. that, that's, that's going to be a challenge for a long time. Right on. And then we can talk about, let's, so let me do the four, four horsemen first. Yeah. And then maybe in the next episode, uh, we can talk about, we can take each one of those and, and then layer decarbonization on top and then see what happens then. Sounds like you know? a plan to me. Okay. So my, my second horseman of the HVAC ellipse is commoditization or if you will, commodification of HVAC. So this is, we touched upon this in, the, in, the, in a different episode. This is like the race to the bottom on price. HVAC is sold as a bulk commodity. It's not sold on value. So it's not sold on non-energy benefits. It's not sold on, you know, where you spend a vast majority of your private life in your home. And we are here to make your living as comfortable as and healthy 
as possible. We, we, HBI contractors don't sell on that. They sell on here's the here's 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 the cheapest you know equipment you can get in. I can get it in as quick as two hours from now. And and here's an incentive program that will give you 80 bucks back. <laughs> and you know, th and that's it. So the, so HVAC is commod is commodified. And it, there's a commodification, commoditization of HVAC. We should where... define those two, actually. Okay. Um, so commoditization is when it, you, a specialized trade becomes commoditized. So it becomes more of a commodity. Uh, like I discussed last time, that's when people don't realize that cheap paint is bad. Um, mm. uh, so they're, they're just like, oh, well, it's, it's just all about price. It doesn't matter. There's no difference in the products. Uh, it's all a commodity. Uh, right. where commodification with an F is taking something that currently is not uh, a, a, commod a commodity or, or, or it's not, it doesn't have a good process behind it. It's making it saleable. Um, so you're taking something that previously you couldn't sell and now you can. Like I, I think about uh, Etsy is actually a really good example of that. I mean, uh, most of the sharing things like Airbnb is taking something that previously you couldn't sell and now you can. It commodified people's homes. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it's it's a chunk of our income now. We, we are keeping our Ohio house and it's, it's rented out. Um, so uh, commodifying something is important. And so maybe next time we can dig more into commodifying decarbonization because that's something that has to be done because right now you can't go out and buy a decarbonization job of your house. You just, you can't. Right. Um, I keep hearing this again and again and again, and particularly I'm hearing it, which is amazing in the Bay Area in California. And I mean, that's where decarb is, is happening. Ground zero. Kind of, yeah, it's ground zero. And it's like, well, I want to I want to put a heat pump in my house. And I called contractors like, oh, no, you don't want that. You just want a furnace. Like, so do you recognize like this is ground zero and you can't do what you want to do? Um, mm -hmm. It is not yet commodified. So yeah, commoditization and commodification are both problems here. Fantastic distinction. So let me try to try an analogy to see if I'm, if I'm getting it right in my mm -hmm. head. So commoditization, which is one of the problems, is homeowners do not know, cannot differentiate the value between a couple of different contractors, just like how people can't tell the benefits of a cheap coat of paint versus a high quality, more expensive best coat of paint. liar wins. Um, who tells the best story? Um, yep. They're the best. Um, yep. how, how are you going to prove it? I mean, it's, it's not like, uh, it's like, oh, I'm the fastest runner. Great. We're going to the track uh, with a stopwatch. We're going to find out. Um, there, there is no way to do that when somebody says they're good. Yeah. So, so people don't, so people might not be able to differentiate between a good, 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 you know, a good contractor versus a bad contractor, just like they don't know the difference between a good coat of paint and a bad coat of paint until after the fact. Yes. So that, that's one problem, which is commoditization. Commodification is when things like home comfort boil down, like complicated problems around um, a home as a system. A system is turned into a single commodity that you can sell, which is HVAC. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by that is HVAC uh, contractors, when they compete only on price and not talk about the value that they can provide to a home, yeah. in terms of being able to solve the comfort problems, moisture problems, you know, like uh, air quality problems, and all of those issues with your house are boiled down to making a budget purchasing decision on a single commodity, which is HVAC. That's commodification. So, yep. so what happens, and we talked about this in a different episode, 85% of installs happen on duress. So, you know, which means that, you know, in, in a cold winter night, your furnace breaks down. That's commodification. You want someone to come in as quickly yep. as possible, sell you a commodity. You want heat. Not, you aren't, you don't, aren't worried about the quality of heat. You just want heat. And that is a 15 or 20 year decision that yep. you're making with a gun to your head. Um, that's, that is, yeah, not, not the way you want to do it. So yeah, that there's, that's a problem. So let, so let's unpack this a little bit because we unpacked the earlier commoditization when homeowners can't tell the difference between a good contractor and a bad contractor, mm -hmm. then you, you said the best liar wins, you know, the best one of the best marketing plan wins, the best one of the cheapest mm -hmm. wins. And, and, and then whatever problems come up after the fact, you know, that's, that's between the homeowner and their ability to get the contract to come in and fix those problems. Right. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you want to expand on that? I'm sure there is, but uh, but we'll let's come keep back. going to number we'll, three. We'll, yeah, but, but I would just I want to layer decarb on that. Um, yeah, and uh, so on part B on on number two, just briefly uh, on commodification, what happens when a homeowner? What happens when HVAC contractors compete on price and price alone? What does that do to the industry when we're racing to the bottom? Well, it's going to kill your quality. Um, you're going to get early failures. You're going to get weird problems, and those are ultimately going to cost the client. Um, all right, so I, after, I can't remember the full phrase, but it's uh, um, the, what is it? The, the bitterness of poor quality outlasts, um, uh, you know, getting a, a low price. Got um, it. 
So it, when, when things break, like, it, yeah, so you got a deal on it, but it's broken and you have to buy another one. Congratulations for getting a good deal, you moron. Um, <laughs> like that's, that, that is basically what comes of the industry. And we see that sort of thing all the time. Um, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll give one quick example. Um, it, the more I've learned about what's called static pressure, or we call it duct pressure because it's easier to understand. So it, it, basically, if you blow up a balloon and you hold the end closed, it has static pressure inside. So there's pressure inside that can't go anywhere. It's static. Um, but we call it duct pressure. The same thing happens inside ducts. You want that pressure to be high enough. So basically, if you open up the end of the balloon, it flows. You get velocity pressure, but not so high that the balloon pops. And the same principle works in an HVAC system. You want it to be high enough so it flows, but not too low, uh, and then also not so high that it pops. So when static pressures get too high, it puts a bunch of back pressure on the fans. It slows down the airflow, which is going to be hard on all the components. The furnace is going to get too hot in the heat exchanger. The, the coil is going to get too hot or too cold, depending on what it's doing, air conditioning or heating. Um, and early failure throughout the system is endemic at that point. 70% uh, of systems from a data set that I got are above specification from the manufacturer. Should be no more than half an inch of water column. 70% of systems, and remember these are contractors that are actually testing and not many do. And some of these systems are surely ones that they replaced. So it's probably better than it was before because they're paying attention to static. Um, so that's in that data set that 70% are above spec um, in above average contractors, which means reality is probably worse. Almost half, 47% are above 0.7 uh, tenths of an inch, which is considered the danger zone for failure for the new variety of fan motors that are out. So uh, almost half of uh, systems out there have install problems so large that they're very likely to cause early failure. Um, that is what happens by slam, bam, thank you, ma'am, uh, free quotes, uh, race to the bottom. Uh, we, we get poor oh. installs. And at this point, when it comes to HVAC, we can make it more efficient, but we're getting to the point where it doesn't matter anymore. Mm. Uh, you can buy a 98% furnace. We can't do any better because you, you can't burn it any better than that. Like we're at the edge of stoichiometry. Um, uh, it's bad things are going to start happening going beyond that. And getting beyond 90%, eh, like 90% to 94, does it matter? Probably not. Getting from 50 to 90, which is what we've done, that's that's a huge thing. Um, but we're, we're running out of, of room there. So now the problem is not so much in the efficiency of the appliances. And same goes for air conditioners and heat pumps. We're getting good enough that it, now we don't need to focus on appliance efficiency. We need to focus on install quality and overall system quality. That's where the next gains are going to come from. But you can't make those gains for low price. No, and, and you're not going to make those gains off the backs of uh, a business model of where it's the fastest and the cheapest guy that gets the job invariably because homeowners, they, 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 they ask for quotes, they'll default to the cheapest guy who can get there as fast as he can. And so the, the market is structured in a way that it incentivizes uh, this kind of behavior. So we're not going to advance on any of these other metrics that you talked about yeah. on the strengths of guys who are just bam, bam, thank you, ma'am. It's like get in, get out, go quick sale. Yes. So, so now we need to commodify the comfort and commodify the better installs right. um, because we have de-commoditized everything until now. Makes sense. So fantastic. So this is actually a good segue into our my next, uh, my third horseman of the, uh, of the HVAC list. And that's what I'm calling business model whiplash. And what I mean by that is there's a lot of stop and start programs incentive programs from utilities, from governments that come and go seemingly um, off their own accord. No one knows when, I mean, after, sometimes programs end at the end of election, uh, but they come and go and there's, and there's rapidly changing kind of regulation that messes, like if you're a business, you're trying to develop a sustainable business model, especially when your margins are super tiny, given that you're yeah. trying to get the smallest bid in possible and do the quickest job possible. What happens when, and we touched on this in a different episode, we'll link that in the bottom of this, of this, you know, this episode. We expanded on that in a little more detail, but can you, can you give a brief summary of what happens when, when you're trying to develop a business around these like rapidly changing government regulations, programs that come and go, how, how does it affect a contractor's, HVAC contractor's business model? Um, well, so I'm going to jump to a different industry. Um, let's talk about the solar industry okay. and what is known as the solar coaster. Uh, so it like on and off, there's, there, there's an incentive that goes in. So, uh, you know, say January 1st, an incentive program starts and then it ends December 31st. So let's just say it's a one-year program. Um, it comes in and it makes it fairly rich. So people go out there and they sell stuff. Um, and, but because people know it's going to end fourth quarter is usually insane. 
So everybody's trying to beat the clock and get it. Um, uh, and, and like, uh, was it in the, the tax incentives? If you had bought the equipment, I think you had to spend like 10% of the project money. If you bought it, as long as you did it within the next three years, you could still backdate that incentive. Um, but it's creating this cliff so that everybody's slammed fourth quarter <laughs> but nobody knows if it's going to happen the next year. So everybody's trying to jam all that stuff in. And then January 1st comes again and business falls off a cliff. What happens to the sales of that company? And if the sales fall off a cliff, what happens to profits? Um, and if the sales fall off, can you keep the employees? And this is really problematic because you train people and then you lose the training. Um, I mean, I guess it feels like kids' summer vacation, how they, they lose like 40% of what they learned the year before over summer vacation. Um, and I watched this in weatherization, which is uh, it's the, the low-income weatherization program from the, the U.S. government. So they, they have a large budget, and then they feed it out to the, all 50 states in a certain amount, and then the states deal with it from there. And it's, in general, a really good program. So it figured out a ton of the building science. So much of what we know technically about making houses work well, we learned from weatherization. So that part was awesome. That that's we view government's good at a couple of things. It's good at R and D because R and D doesn't pay well. I mean, like the last nine years of my life have largely been R and D trying to figure out residential decarb. And I can tell you from personal experience, it doesn't pay for crap. Um, <laughs> just constantly trying to hand to mouth to sell a project so I can make enough to keep going. Um, R and D is something the government's good at. Um, then government's also good at being first customer. So when you're trying to get through the valley of death where there's nobody to buy something, um, that's where government's good. And WAP also serves, Weatherization Assistance Program, also serves as first customer. Mm -hmm. So they're really good. So now that you have kind of an understanding of that, this goes to low-income homes and it does insulation and sometimes it'll do health and safety stuff and sometimes it'll do a furnace, things like that. Um, but in general, I really like the program. Now, in 09, with the ARA program, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, uh, Obama 10 x the budget for weatherization. For those couple of years, 2008, 2009. Yes. Yep, exactly. And this is what Biden's talking about doing right now too, um, is he wants to weatherize 2 million homes, which is going to be a huge jump. So I was part of that back when I was contracting. So I did, uh, it wasn't, I don't know, 20 of them, something like that. So it was, it, it wasn't like a gigantic number of jobs, but definitely we did it. And I learned a lot. In fact, a lot of my chops come from the training that I got from there. So the technical training is fantastic, uh, but they don't need to sell anything. In fact, they struggle to sell weatherization jobs to low-income people for free. <laughs> um, we, we actually, we showed up to someone's job um, and they refused us. We couldn't work that day. They're like, no, you can't come in. Um, like, this is free work that's going to make your life better. Um, so they, they have difficulty selling something for free, uh, which is kind of wild. But my point of, of this whole story is, a whole lot of people got trained, a whole lot of equipment got bought, you know, the blower doors and blowing machines and just all kinds of stuff that got bought. Um, after the ARA era, they cut original funding to half of original levels, which means okay. it was a 95% drop in funding. So you, so you 10 x funding for two years mm -hmm. and then you 0.5 x it. <laughs> so you went, well, so you went up and then you actually went down. You actually 0 0.05 x it. Um, oh it was 5% of what it was. 5%? Okay. Yeah, it was a 95% reduction in funding. Okay. Right um, so all of that training that you did, like, yes, you gave people jobs and you did stuff, but you just, uh, you went straight up and then you went straight down. Yep. And that is what cliff incentives tend to do. So in the solar world, that's called the solar coaster. Um, so, it, it, you know, business is good for a year um, until incentives end, and then it craters the next year. And then it comes up again and it craters. Now, the key thing that we want to do in residential decarbon, just decarbonization in general, we, we need to have a smooth upward slope that is geometric. We, we can't bounce around. So uh, what these programs have caused is to a large degree a bell curve, but it's worse than a bell curve because it's like it goes up uh, as a bell curve and then it falls off a cliff. Um, it's a bell cliff. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, I, I just picture like Wiley Coyote, um, you know, going up a cliff or going up a hill and then running out on a cliff and looking down and being like, oh crap. And then, uh -oh. Hoo, 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 hoo. Um, and if we want to succeed at decarbonization, we cannot under any circumstances do that because we are out of time. We were out of time a decade ago. We are really, really out of time now. Um, and so if we create business model whiplash over this, which is what happens with kitchen table uh, programs that mess up things, you, you, you create demand and then you kill it and then you create demand and then you kill it. And we need to encourage in whatever way we can that uh, geometric slope. Like if and this we are experiencing 50% annual growth year over year or more, we're going to fail, period. So when you say 50% annual growth, are you talking about new contractors or, or contractors doing business? Like they're 
Well, it's going to be everything. So, I mean, it will be a yeah. number of contractors on one hand, but ultimately what we're looking for is number of jobs. Yep. So, I mean, rough numbers, we have 100 million existing homes in the U.S. Um, Canada is probably about a tenth of that because it's, you know, populations, you know, 35 million in Canada and, you know, 330 in the U.S., something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's 100 million existing homes in the U.S. 40, mil 40 million of them are already electric, primarily in the southeast of the United States, um, some in the Southwest, but the Southeast is really heavily heat pumps because um, they work well in milder climates, up to climate zone four, they work really well. Um, and they, you know, they didn't have enough gas supply and they figured out how to make electricity pretty reasonably. So economics drove the Southeast to already be electric. So 40 million of hundred million are already done. Although we are, we're losing that war year by year because heat pumps, uh, single stage heat pumps just deliver okay experiences. So when people get access to gas, they're usually hooking up. So we're going backwards in a lot of cases, uh, but it, just, let's just say we have the 60 million. We, if we want to finish by uh, 2050, we'll call it 30 years rather than 29 to make the math easy. We need to be doing 2 million homes a year hmm. starting. Let me check my watch yesterday. In fact, a year ago, um, because now we need like 2.05 million a year. So number of houses converted is really what we're aiming for. And if we don't see really fast growth, we, I mean, by the time we, we get to where um, we, we have 100% electrification happening all, all the time, it's still a 20 year clock. So uh, instead of uh, like, I mean, it's going to take 20 years once we get to 100% to actually uh, uh, decarbonize everything because you have to work through all the existing stuff. We're going to need to do more than 2 million homes a year. And then if we want to move the goal up to 2040, you know, we're going to be talking four or 5 million homes a year. Um, in the Bay Area, you know, decarb central in the United States, they can't do hundreds of homes a year. We are screwed. Um, yeah. And yeah. so if we aren't careful in incentive design and we, we set people up to start uh, decarbonizing and we, we throw lots of money at them and then we take the money away or we create rules that uh, get too hard to do, you're going to stop that, that upward swing and you're going to kill it. So we cannot do that bell, the, the, the bell curve cliff. We, we can't do that if we're going to succeed. I can validate, you know, I, I can substantiate what you're saying by just my own research here in Canadian cities on, you know, and what they're doing in terms of being able to. So in order to meet their goals, there's a certain uptake rate, right? Like the rate yeah. you're talking about and the number of homes that you want to decarbonize or switch to renewables and stuff like that. The uptake rate you want is in the order of several hundreds, you know, thousands of homes every every year, every decade. Mm -hmm. Several, you know, hundred dozen houses every year. But the number of houses they've actually done over the past five or six years is maybe 40 or 50. <laughs> and there's not enough contractors in the entire province to do the number of jobs that are required in just, you know, one of the major, like one of the few major cities in my province alone, you know? Yeah. And so the industries have got to grow both in terms of size, more contractors being able to take on this challenge, but also for each contractor, their business models, the, the number of people they employ, uh, the, the size of jobs that they do has to grow while still maintaining the same level of success that they have with the current other job. And so when you expand incentives, like rapidly expand incentives, not every business is able to respond to that sustainably in a way that, yeah. that they can take and learn and then retain. If, if you're a, and you've talked about this before, you know, every business, every time you scale by three X, it's a whole new business. Yep. So if you're a one truck truck at, with one, like a single guy or girl with an HVAC company, you're making, you know, hundred thousand dollars a year, $300,000 a year to go from like hundred or 300, let's say 300 to like a million. Then now you in have sales. a couple of people in sales, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In sales. Then all of a sudden now you're employing, two or three people, then that needs a whole new approach to admin, to HR, to, you know, workplace safety policies and all of these things, managing them. Then we go from 1 million in sales to 3 million in sales. Now you've got a couple of, couple of different trucks, you're expanding a service territory. So each time you scale up, you become a new business. And so now when we're talking about expanding the industry, there are existential risks that come from expanding mm -hmm. too quickly, not being able to man, maintain a workforce like that, not being able to sustain jobs of that size or magnitude. Uh, when, when you come up with like these kind of new incentive programs, so you have this whiplash where you've suddenly expanded your, you, you've hired new people because there's this NX of incentive and you've pivoted your business model to, to incorporate those incentives. And then now this incentive goes away. Now you're stuck with three trucks and 10 guys and you don't have the same old jobs because you know, the funding has dropped off. Now what exactly. are you doing? So to me, whatever program you propose, can you 1000 exit without changing it? So I mean, what's tempting is you can use a program to very quickly ramp, but you're only looking at the first year or two mm -hmm. and then you kill it. 
Um, so you create that cliff and everybody falls off the cliff. I would much rather see a slower ramp that is sustainable all the way up. So it's geometric. So it may take three years to get the ramp to really start rolling. But once it starts rolling, if it is totally unstoppable, we win. Um, I guess I, I think uh, the, the old story of um, it was a wise man who went to a king and uh, showed a, uh, a chessboard and yeah. said, uh, uh, what was it? Uh, One grain of rice on the first yeah, uh, square. Two, two, yeah, two, and four. four. And yeah. then the king is like, okay, that's great. That sounds doable. But by the time we get to the 64th square, I think, yep. um, it was, you end it, up with more grain than there is on the planet. Yes, exactly. And that that's what we're looking for is that geometric growth. If we don't create that geometric growth, we will fail. Yeah. So this so contractors who are burned by this whiplash with previous programs are somewhat skeptical about participating and, and having that kind of the, the intervention from policymakers in this domain. So they'd rather yeah. have a program that rather have ways in which they can scale their business because they because everyone wants to grow, and yeah. grow but grow sustainably. And so yeah. so we need to figure so we can come back to that in the next episode when we talk about living on decarbonization on top of this. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we scale business and grow and an opportunity in there? Yes, exactly. So to summarize my third uh, apocalypse there, the business model whiplash between the program starting and ending and falling off the cliff and stuff makes it difficult for um, HVAC contractors to grow, not just grow their business, but also for new HVAC contractors to come in and occupy that space. And if we're not growing, then we're not reaching our goals, our, our climate yeah. and energy goals. If HVAC industry is not growing, uh, we're not reaching our climate goals. So we're So in order to reach our climate and energy goals, I think a common purpose that we can all share is to help HVAC industry sustainably grow. Yes. And right now, incentive programs, because of the whiplash, makes it difficult for new business, new contractors to enter into the market and makes it difficult for contractors to sustainably expand their existing business model. So that's a that's a big yep. existential risk. Yep. And a key point there, just to hammer it home, um, whatever program you design, if you can't 1,000 exit, you shouldn't do it because we need to 1,000 X whatever we're doing. Makes sense. Um, so the last one, and this is a big one, Mm -hmm. yeah, is um, a cultural decline in workmanship. A cultural decline both in valuing workmanship and demonstrating workmanship. And this is a and, and this is not just within the HVAC industry, but broadly culturally. You know, I, I'm noticing, and it just even just in my decade of time in North America, it, we touched on parts of this earlier where you know we we force kids into university systems and, and that sort of thing, but the shop class not as not just as a career but as a vocation and a hobby is dying mm -hmm. people don't spend enough time part of this is you know consumerism you know stuff is cheaper uh, and, and and you know it's some for a lot of time and and because people have busy lives and you know being there uprooted from their family and not many people might have the means and the methods and you know they, they might not live close enough to their family members or peers mm -hmm. who might be involved in some of these hobbies like woodcrafting and stuff like that uh, and so people in general there's a decline in workmanship there's a decline in maintenance people don't want to tinker with stuff anymore not at least as much yeah. as they used to uh people don't want to upgrade and, and just oil oil their cars regularly anymore and all of this what this comes down to is that people don't want to take care of and nurture and and maintain their hvac systems yeah. at home anymore and as a consequence of that, uh, they just want to fix things when they break. Yeah. And they want, and, and, and maybe you talked about this earlier, 85% of HVAC replacements, furnace replacements happen under duress. And most HVAC installers make most of their money and get most of their jobs during the four peak months in a year. So the two coldest months of the year and the two warmest months of the year is when most systems break. Yep. And the reason most systems are deep, and, and that itself is, is, I mean, that's a structural problem. I mean, I get it. Stuff breaks when it has to do most work. And I understand that. But I think the challenge that I'm hearing in the industry that what I'm picking up on is those peak months. It's called the, the double humpback problem, right? It's the camel humps. Yeah, two hump, two, months, camel. two, two hump, hump camel problem. Those humps are getting bigger and bigger. So a vast majority of a contractor's uh, jobs happen in those four months and, and the percentage of the jobs that they do those four months is keep getting bigger and bigger. So it, it's forcing, it's like, it's just forcing the entire industry to capitalize on those like four months where they have like people working overtime, like 16, 17 hour days. They're doing 10 jobs a day. And, and as a result, because of, because, and, and, and this is in part driven by the fact that workmanship is not valued and, and maintenance and, and tinkering around stuff is not valued by the homeowners. So they don't do maintenance well enough. And so stuff keeps breaking. And then because of the earlier problem we talked about, because they don't value um, 
workmanship of the contractor and because the commoditization you talked about where they can't tell the difference between a good contractor yeah. and a bad contractor a good workman and a bad workmanship yeah. and so this is and so this is driving the industry to a point where you guys and girls are doing 10 12 jobs working uh 10 12 service calls, calls. Yep. service calls uh on 17 18 hour days for four months of the year and the rest of the time is mostly just downtime and yep. so this is driving like it's this is driving like a very frenetic and hectic pace in the industry that is leading to and we talked about like mental health and employee burnout uh, yep. and this is leading to a, this is leading to what i believe is almost like a walmartization of hvac industry where you have like hvac companies that grow in size because they can do this sort of dispatch at scale mm -hmm. and it's it's leading to a, a, a lack just like walmartization of products is leading to a lack of workmanship and a lack of a culture it's just like a circle that feeds onto itself yeah so i'll take a step back i think there's yeah. there's two sides to this okay. um so one is we know how to make stuff really cheap in china so if a product is forty dollars and it's a lot of work to fix you should just buy another forty dollar product um, at the end of the day, that's that's what you should do. And also, a lot of products are manufactured, so they are no longer easy to service. So they basically are throwaway products. So that that's one piece of it. Um, and that's that's globalization. Like that's free trade. That's what it leads to. We all do the things we're most efficient at, and we drive costs down. Like that's that's how it works. We we have an amazing amount of stuff these days. That's cheap. Um, I mean, this microphone. Um, this is a really nice mic for hundred bucks. Um, you know. My, my two podcast buddies, um, Brian Orr and Stephen Lacey, they're both like, this is the one you want, um, which is pretty wild to hear. This happens to be an American-made one, uh, but it, we know how to make things cheap now. Um, so that's one piece of it is that things are just replaceable. The other piece is uh, when it comes to cars, they're just better. I mean, it used to be a 100,000 mile car was worn out, take it to the junkyard. My wife's car has 205,000 miles on it. It's got some dings and scratches. You know, it's it's not the nicest car in the world, um, but it it runs. I'd go in it, get in it right now and drive to California right now. Well, it needs an oil change. So I change the oil and then take off for California. Uh, but uh, it, because things tend to last so long and our engineering has gotten better in so many ways, we don't learn how to work on stuff. <laughs> um, and so I think that's a, that's a fundamental thing. So like I, I see so many of my white collar friends, they, they are terrified of the mechanical things in their life. And I find myself doing that too. I'm, I'm not extremely mechanical, but I'm, I'm pretty decent. Um, I, I would say I'm marginally above average. Um, uh, and part of that is because I grew up just around mechanical stuff. Um, like I said, I've, I've rebuilt three engines. Only one of them blew up. Um, <laughs> um, I still don't know what I did on that thing. Um, but it was, it was a two, it was a two twenty thousand dollars motors that survived. So I'm glad those survived. Um, uh, so my, my car was the one that died. Uh, but you know, I, we, we generally are not teaching kids how to work on stuff anymore. So one thing that I hear pretty consistently from contractors is these 18 year old kids don't know which end of the screwdriver to use. Mm -hmm. So we have to teach them basic mechanical skills before we can even begin to teach them the actual trade. And so this is a really steep climb. And we're asking this of them while, like you said, they're going through the two hump camel and while they're being looked down on. So it's kind of funny, like I'm terrified of this, but why did they want so much money to fix that? Like it brings out everybody's Karen. Um, and it's like, damn it, like appreciate the, the knowledge of it or the, the phrase like, um, you're not paying me for the half an hour of time that it took me to fix this. You are paying me for all the time that it took me to learn how to do this in half an hour. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so that's a key thing, or, or there's something I call blue collar art, which is a job that is done for the love of doing it well. Uh, my favorite yeah. example is like going to an electric panel and all the wires are just dead perfect around it. Or you see a, a boiler job where all the pipes are just perfect and it looks like art. It's it, nobody even sees that thing, but it's done and beautifully. Th and this is part of the tacit knowledge, right? I mean, I'm a I'm, I'm a programmer in, in part. Mm -hmm. It's part of what, what I do is I write computer programs and I know what beautiful code looks like. Beautiful computer code looks like. I can't describe it. I can't mm -hmm. write down what it is or how to write. I don't, I don't know that I myself can always write beautiful code. But sometimes it's like it's part, so it's doing art at a production scale is what blue color yeah. work is, right? Yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, every, it's not like, you're not just like taking a black box and, and, and putting it down. You have to, there's there's literal craftsmanship involved in doing this. And, and now you're expected to do this at a production scale. How many artists can produce art, beautiful art at a production scale? Do you think Bob Ross can go do 10? I mean, maybe Bob Ross could actually do 10 paintings. You know, 17 paintings. Sad little trees. Yeah, sad little <laughs> trees. I, I'm depressed now because I'm doing so many paintings. Um, yeah. So we're asking craftsmen and women to do, do more and more in less and less time. 
and that those peaks are getting bigger. And so naturally what, what happens, I, I, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a vicious cycle that feeds onto itself is that the workmanship in the industry is not incentivized. And, 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 and also, I mean, again, speaking more broadly, we talked about how workmanship is not valid and culturally, there's also structural problems like the right to repair. You don't have the right to repair a lot of your own car, mm -hmm. some, some of the vehicles now anymore yeah. on your iPads and stuff. You don't have the right to repair and tinker. And so structurally you're barred from working and fixing stuff that you own, you paid with your own money. And, and also there's regulations around what you can fix and not fix. And some of it is valid and maybe some of it is, is a bit much, but and so when you've got these structural barriers against you fixing stuff culturally, regulation wise and, and structurally, then it leads to this problem where the humps of the two hump camel are getting peakier and peakier. Now what happens when you layer decarbonization on top of that? That's something we can talk about perhaps in the next, next episode. One. Thank you for listening to the Boundary Spanners podcast. In this episode, we learned about the four horsemen of the HVACalypse. These are massive selection pressures and existential threats that are looming large on the horizon for the HVAC industry in US and Canada. So the four horsemen of the HVACalypse are num number one, a massive skill shortage in the HVAC industry where many companies struggle with recruiting, retaining, and training a generation of talent that can lead the industry into meeting the challenges of today and tomorrow. This happens in part because trades are undervalued as a career choice for many families. In a society where disdain for the undereducated remains perhaps as the last acceptable prejudice. Number two is commoditization of HVAC, where HVAC is sold only on price and not on value or other distinguishing attributes. When the only thing left to differentiate between one contractor from another or one HVAC system from another is just price, margins in the industry shrink rapidly. This sets up a race to the bottom where everyone including the consumer, ends up losing. Number three is business model whiplash from participating in government or utility programs with funding that ramps up quickly and then immediately and precipitously drops off. Nate calls this the bell curve cliff. While, while funding programs like this can help with technical training or upskilling some contractors, the whiplash from participating in this sort of start and stop funding programs makes it difficult for HVAC contractors to scale their company and grow their business model in a sustainable and sustained way over a long period of time. Lastly, but also crucially, is the cultural decline of craftsmanship, tinkering, maintenance and upkeep. Very few households in US and Canada invest in regular maintenance and upkeep of their heating and cooling systems. This leads to what the HVAC industry calls the double humpback camel problem, where the HVAC industry ends up making most of its revenue and doing most of its service calls during the two warmest and the two coldest months of the year. And this is when most systems happen to break down as a consequence of a lack of regular maintenance. And what's been happening in the recent years is that the peaks of this double humpback camel are only getting much and much steeper. This ends up setting up a frenetic pace for the industry, leading to a decline in workmanship on the side of HVAC contractors and an undervaluing of workmanship by homeowners, which again feeds back into the other horse of the HVAC lips, like the commoditization or the walmartization of the HVAC industry. Taken together, these four horsemen of the HVAC ellipse pose a massive existential threat to the future of the HVAC industry. And since all roads to residential decarbonization go through HVAC contractors, it is perhaps in the shared interests of policymakers and the HVAC industry to find ways of grappling with these four horsemen of the apocalypse. As a policymaker, my head is already churning with a whole bunch of ideas, but for now, I will leave you with this one big question. What happens when you layer on decarbonization 
on top of an industry that's already grappling with the existential threat of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. We will be asking and answering questions like these in the next and subsequent episodes of the Boundary Spanners podcast. Thanks for listening.